Good evening, everybody. My name is Charity Rouse. I am the Director of Local History for the Spartanburg County Public Library System. And this is our continuing monthly uh, genealogy series that runs each year from October through June, and sometimes through July and August as well, just depends. We are available on the first Monday night of each month for this live online um, presentation right now. And we are recording this to be posted on the library's YouTube channel. So you can tell your friends about it. It usually takes us three to six days to get it up because it's someone in a different department has to do the, the posting to the YouTube ch channel. Uh, but we do have a genealogy playlist there. And um, almost all of the presentations that I have done over the past two years are available in our genealogy playlist. Um, so feel free to take a look there. Uh, we do not have a handout tonight. I promise I will get a handout uh, next month that covers last month, this month, and next month. As a, this is a three-part series on micro-local resources for genealogy. This is part two. In April, we will do uh, a session on how to find things in the 1950 census, which will become public on April 1st. Hopefully I can get the right screenshots before uh, April 4th, um, if we haven't crashed the National Archives website too much uh, once it releases. So do uh, take a look at that. Um, so tonight, we are talking about micro local resources for genealogy. This is our second part. Um, and what do I mean by micro local? Well, what I mean by micro local is that these are resources that were pro produced in a particular location for use in that location. These are often only found in that geographical area. And sometimes you may find them at a local or state archive. They are of targeted interest for those in a small geographical area. They are often not high on a list of items to digitize, and often only a small time frame will be available. So these are very niche resources. Now, the ones I'm presenting are resources that we have available through the Kennedy Room and um, through our library, either online or uh, in, in the room. But you will find similar resources um, wherever you are researching. Uh, great places to find those resources include uh, local libraries, state and local archives, historical societies, genealogical societies. Um, ask around. Uh, because you may be surprised at what types of things might be available. So, some types of microlocal records. Last month, we looked at um, county or city clerk records for the most part, including municipal court records, special or called court minutes, uh, county or city council meeting minutes, birth, marriage, or death records outside of mandated state reporting. Um, next month, we're gonna look a little bit more at local businesses or organization records, including funeral homes, store or hotel ledgers, church records, clubs and community board records, newspapers. Um, also a couple of mop-up things that didn't make it in last month or this month. Uh, we do have a city of Spartanburg local birth and death register that predates South Carolina requiring that information in 1915. It's not complete. Uh, we don't have all of the years, but it is a treasure trove if you do have someone who shows up in that. And then there is a school ledger that we have in physical format in our archive that I, um, was unable to get images of in time for this program. And I've got plenty of images in this program. So we'll catch that one next month. So tonight we're gonna look primarily at educational records. 
Um, and some of the records include things that list faculty and staff and others list students. And um, so you'll see a variety of types of, of records and um, things that can be helpful. So some of the things that you might that we're gonna look at tonight, some school surveys, board of education reports, faculty and staff directories at the local and state levels, teachers association records, yearbooks, um, school newspapers, classroom attendance reports, report cards, and promotion certificates. Um, I don't have examples of all of those, but they are things to be looking out for. Because one of the things with these education records is, if you know what grade someone is in, you can get an estimate of their birth year um, so that you can um, at least do a circa, an about date for them. So we're gonna jump into these school surveys and reports. Now, at first glance, you're like, ah, well, that's not gonna have my ancestor in it. It's just gonna be numbers about how many students attended. Well, yes and no. It depends on the report and it depends on the year. So this is the Department of Education, Superintendent of Education, teachers reports for salary and expense reimbursement submitted by county school commissioners. It is a collection that is physically at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History in Columbia. And that uh, collection code is S152027 if you are looking for other counties. Um, it covers a very narrow time frame, 1868 to 1870, but what had just happened was we finished up the Civil War. We're trying to get particularly Southern society back on the rails and being productive again from the devastation that was our Civil War. Um, we are now in the situation where we are trying to educate both our white students and our black students uh, for the first time on the black student side. And so it's one of those situations where these records can be a treasure trove, depending on who you're looking for and when, and whether they would have been school age during this time period. This um, largely is not microfilmed. We are fortunate that someone asked the archives to, um, microfilm the Spartanburg County records. And I did not find the piece of paper that said, hey, these have been microfilmed until I got to the bottom of the stack one day when I was at the archives. So I had been taking cell phone pictures to let myself know, hey, we need to request these records. And then I discovered we already had it on microfilm and I just didn't know that little roll of microfilm existed in one of our uh, miscellaneous Spartanburg records drawers in our mark microfilm cabinet. So I learn something every day myself on records that we have and have available. Now there's also an in-house uh, index that was done um, when we got the roll of film in um, years ago. And um, so I will show you what that looks like as well. So um, in this, each school has typically at the front of the paperwork, a listing of this is the, hey, reimburse me for my services rendered in teaching school this year. So the school teacher didn't get paid until the very end of the school year. And so the school year for this particular um, set of records runs 1869, November 1st, 1869, ends on October 31st in 18, sorry, 1868 to October 31st, 1869. This particular record was submitted by James C. Foster. He was a teacher um, at the Kirby Springs uh, School. And 
the whole number of days that he had students per day, student, he student heads in the classroom, uh, 1,301. And the price allowed per day is five cents. So five cents times 1,301 total student days, uh, $65.05. And then he had been paid by some of the families who could afford it or to help out $7.40 local support. And that was deducted so that the state paid the balance of $57.65. So, and then the bottom is the receipt saying, hey, I or the top is the I received this payment. And the item on the side is on the bottom of the page. It was a legal size folded. And so this would have been this kind of spine outside of the folded papers for that packet when they sent it in. I turned the image right side up so it was easier to read. So this is what his report looks like. Um, he numbers the students and starts out with Samuel Smith. And there's an, the part on the right is just an enlargement of the top of the report on the left, that's the full page. But Samuel Smith is a boy, started school July 19th, left the school August 30th, AF Foster, or sorry, AJ Foster, I think that is, um, also a boy, July 19th, September 12th, and so, and then there's the total days of attendance for each student. So it's the total days of attendance that gets added up to that, um, number uh, times five cents. So 29, 39, 34, 27. Um, Minerva Foster, uh, she attended the whole time it was open at 61 days. At the end of the school um, packet, there was the teacher's report. And so um, this is this tells us where Pacolet in Pacolet Township is where Kirby Spring School is. And um, the location of the school is near Batesville, Batesville Post Office. And the school term commenced on July 19th, 1869 and ended October 29th, 1869. So it was a three month school term. So not like today where we start in August and we go through June or May or whatever the timing is in, in a typical school area. Um, this was a three month school term. Um, it was one male teacher. The account accompanying the report includes the salary of all teachers at the school, yes. And he had 50 scholars over 16 years of age, two scholars age six to 16. Average attendance, I believe that number is 26. And these were white children. So this is the standard report that they have to turn in. So also included uh, in this group of, of examples um, and of, of reports turned in is an example from uh, one of our uh, African-American schools. So Eva M. Poole is submitting this report and for reimbursement of $596.50. Um, this is actually the ending of her 179 students. And again, the full page is on the left and a zoom in is on the right. Um, and so it was 11,730 days, total days, uh, total students. Now, I was like, well, this is different than, than the previous one. Well, let's look at the teacher's report because there's some differences here. Again, it's that standard November 1st, 1868 to October 31st, 1869. The teacher filling in the report is Eva M. Poole. School place is Spartanburg Courthouse of Spartanburg County. And it is the colored free school. It is located in Spartanburg Village. We weren't 
the city until actually we weren't even a town until a little bit later and then a city in the 1900s so their school year ran a lot longer that was their school term was from january 11th 1869 to september 24th 1869 and so they went for nine months they received no additional tuition or aid and they had three female teachers they had eva pool Estelle Morgan and Mrs. Matthew. And so one of the things they ask on this form, how many Northern white teachers, how many Southern white teachers, how many Northern colored teachers, and how many Southern colored teachers? Uh, because remember, this is during Reconstruction, and many people, um, places had volunteer teachers come from the North to help, help educate the freed slaves in particular. Um, so there were, there was one Southern white teacher and two Southern colored teachers. Presumably Eva Poole is the, the white teacher, but I don't have anything to back that up other than that is my guess. That could be further researched, obviously. And um, this does cover uh, the salary of all teachers at the school. So that also explains there are three teachers teaching these students. So the 11,000 uh, days uh, makes sense. So they had 11 scholars that were over 16, 179 scholars aged six to 16. And the average attendance is very light. And I want to say it's 25. Um, so, you know, some of these take the number for what it's worth. And these students were colored students. So these are great resources because you get the names of the students, you get a little bit about how long were they in school that year. Well, this particular group had the option of full nine months. If we look back on the previous page, you will see that most of the students attended for somewhere between, oh, 30 and 40 days, maybe, some as few as 14 days, some as many as 39 days on this particular page. So it depends student to student. And they would be grouped uh, in three classrooms in this case. And with 179 students, uh, that could get, you know, a little tight if it was all the students each time. Now, some of these names may repeat throughout the list. So you'll have to check the list to see more. And again, these are available statewide. Uh, it's just that we only have the Spartanburg County ones and Spartanburg County is the only one that has been microfilmed to my knowledge. So this is the index that uh, was done by Kennedy Room staff a number of years ago. Um, it, is a it is bound in green library binding. Um, and so the, in the introduction, it tells a little bit more about the teacher's reports and that it tells you the various things we've looked at. Um, and it does pull out some information that only four of the 36 schools were for African-American children. Um, and only one of the schools claimed to have been set up to be integrated. However, the school reported that no African-Americans applied to be admitted to that school. Um, and university, universal education was a controversy in that time period because prior to the Civil War, uh, education of white students was not universal either. So um, in the list of schools in this index, you see the name of the school, you see whether it served black or white students, the location of the school, and the name of the um, head teacher. Um, and so 
at least it's helpful to be able to read that if you don't want to read through the microfilm and the handwriting, or you want to find out, hey, my, my ancestor was a teacher, maybe they were teaching in this period. It also lists the pupils by school. So um, in Antioch Free School, you see Carrie Drummond, Hattie Drummond, Mandy Drummond, Alvin Berry, Boyce, Elizabeth, George, Marion, Midori and Vana or Vona Durham, Anne Galt, George Galt, and William Galt, Violet Kilgore, and Emma and Margra McElrath. So um, that way, again, you can see was my ancestor a student in this particular place? So the Works Prog Project Administration or Progress Administration, depending on project, I guess, um, did an inventory of Spartanburg County school buildings in 1935. This does not list students' names, but it can give you a lot of information if you happen to know what school building um, or school your ancestor attended then you can find out more about what that school was like through this inventory. Um, they also did an inventory of church buildings. Just as an aside, we have both of those rolls of microfilm if you want to come look at them. Um, and at the beginning of the microfilm roll, um, there is an alphabetical inventory listing of the schools covered. So you know these are the active schools in 1935. There may have been schools that were active before 1935 that are not included because they are no longer active schools. And then other schools weren't in existence in 1935. So just because you do not find the school that you expect to find or by the name you expect to find it does not mean that it didn't exist. It just was not part of the inventory in 1935. Um, and it tells you which district um, the uh, schools were in. So this is Zor School, and um, it's many, many pages long, and I just pulled a few pages out to give it as an example. It says that 85 of their students lived with one mile of the school, the remaining 15 lived within two miles. No one lived three or more miles away from the school. It was a wood frame building with three classrooms, two of which were in use in 1935 with grades one through three in one and four through six in the other. And you do see that they took pictures of each of the schools. And sometimes there are multiple. Um, it tells you how many windows there are and the fire protection procedures for the school and various things like that. So it, it's really kind of interesting from a construction and a reminder that indoor plumbing wasn't really yet a thing for most places. They had pit toilets um, in 1935. So just remember, you're looking at a different era. There is also a sketch of the school. Um, and so it shows you the three rooms. Um, and in classroom one, which served grades one, two, and three, um, there were 27 pupils and there were five windows, three doors, a blackboard, coal stove, 32 single desks, and the teacher had a table as their desk. And the sketch of the school layout is there. So. Um, another place to check for teachers, particularly, would be teachers associations. Now, this is a Union County record because we don't happen to have the Spartanburg County Teachers Association records. Um, and this particular part of it covers 1934 to 1937, but there are a number of, of chunks of records uh, covering various time periods on this particular role of microfilm. Um, and so there are also a variety of resources included on the one roll of microfilm. So it helps when you're working with microfilm to just kind of look at the whole thing, 
scan through, see what you can find because sometimes you find a treasure. Uh, we don't know that there is an index. We may be working on that in-house uh, coming up. Uh, and uh, this is microfilm from the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. So there may be other counties um, that they have collected this information from. So for 1934 and 35, teachers in the Union City Schools, um, it lists out M.T. Jeter, who's the principal of the high school, and um, the teachers there, Monarch School, West End School, Main Street School, etc. And then there is a list of salaries for the various teachers. And these are just representative pages, examples of each of these. So the list on the right is how much each of these teachers is being paid um, for that school year, which doesn't look like a lot to us, but for if you know if they're getting five cents a pupil, um, actually that was 1870. So they're probably getting a little bit more in 1930. But remember, we are in 1934 and 35 in the midst of the Great Depression. So these are actually not horrible salaries for that time. It also lists um, which schools have more than three teachers, which is an interesting way to put it, but you'll also notice that there are five high schools in Union County, and then Union City has one, two, three, four, five, six schools with more than three teachers, and Buffalo has one, Three teacher schools include uh, Cross Keys and Santuck. Two teacher schools, there are what? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And one teacher schools, there are seven. So you're going to have a slightly different experience if you're at one of these more than three teacher schools because you are more likely to have a dedicated or maybe two grades in a class to one grade in a class um, versus a one teacher school where you're all in the same classroom and she, the teacher, most of them, she, but some males um, are bouncing back and forth between the various age groups. Um, in this particular year, they do also list out the colored teachers and what school they teach at in the left-hand list. And again, it's a couple pages long. And then they also include a list of the colored teachers of Union County and their home address. And something that's interesting in the right-hand um, page is that Willie Mae Spears lives in Gaffney. Um, Uh, I thought I had spotted a Spartan. Yeah. Um, James Pruitt at the bottom of the page lives in Spartanburg. So some, some teachers of the, some of the colored teachers live outside of Union County and commute in for their classes. So it's just kind of an interesting thing. Just because they were living in one county doesn't mean they weren't teaching in another county. Uh, we see the same thing today. I have colleagues who live in Greenville County and commute into Spartanburg County. And I know people who commute over to Greenville and down to Union, um, et cetera. So just don't shut yourself off by geography too much. Um, and I've also been told by a, a longtime resident of Woodruff, uh, African-American, that the most of the African American students uh, went to high school in Lawrence County, just over the border. It was the closer high school to go to. It was easier for them to get there. So just because they lived in one county doesn't mean they didn't attend school in another county. Now, there may also be a list of white teachers, but it was not in the part of the film that I looked at. But it, for whatever reason, may have only been colored teachers that they made this list for. Um, you may find um, county school commissioner or superintendent of education reports. 
Um, they were required to turn these into the state of South Carolina. And this is microfilm C-794 from the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. And sometimes the title role, title of a role of microfilm can be misleading because it is titled Annual Report of the County School Commissioner, but it is from the County Superintendent of Education's office and report series. So microfilm, they often lump things together roughly by topic and you might get the name of the first thing on the roll and you don't realize that there are five or six other things on that roll. So we try to make sure we list those on the outside of the box and in the catalog entry, um, but ask staff and or just take some time and look at the roll of film and learn something new. Um, these are instructions to from the General School Code of South Carolina at the time to uh, why this county superintendent was supposed to file the report and what they were supposed to count. Uh, this is the main uh, report page uh, in Spartanburg County um, in, now I'm gonna have to look. It was 1930-31 school year. Um, there were a total of 10,526 white students and 5,451 um, total colored students for a total of 15,977 students. So, and then you get some averages, how many schoolhouses, those types of things, value of property, um, how many teachers were employed. And again, it, it's statistical data but it helps you get an understanding for what was the population, what was the education level, and those types of things for Spartanburg uh, in that year. Um, there was a report of enumeration for both, at this time they were called Negroes, Negroes. Um, and so Zor School had uh, 10 males, 29 females, um, age six, the 20 years, and then ages seven to 14 years, they had 18 men and 26 women, so for a total of 44. So I'm not sure why they were asking the two different age groups, but probably due to different um, categories for a grades one through eight school, and a grade nine through 12 school or one through seven. So, you know, what years the schools covered did um, vary. So, um, and you also see counts of any students who were blind, deaf, or crippled. And so those are the categories on the right. And there were uh, reports of enumeration for white students and I missed getting that screenshot and I apologize. So they did also have enrollment by grades. And um, so Victor Mills is the top one on this particular list. Uh, number of teachers, 16, length of school and days, 180. Um, number of elementary school, one for that community. And then, so they had 67 boys, 49 girls in the first grade, and you continue across the list. So they had a total student population of 452. And then if you look at Fair Forest, Fair Forest had a high school that covered eighth through 11th grades. Um, and so they had 132 in the high school. So you can see the different groups and different counts. So that was enrollment by grades for white students and enrollment by grades for the Negro students follows the same um, chart, but they are separated out. Um, 
so we do have a Board of Education minute book uh, for um, Spartanburg County Board of Education, the minutes of their meetings. Um, the one, what we have on film starts in 1928 and goes well up into the 20th century. Um, this is just the first section of the roll of film. And it starts out with um, the minutes that uh, where they met in the office of the superintendent of education, February 23rd, 1 p.m. Uh, the following people were present, John Waters, J.R. Wofford, Harvey Johnson, Mr. John A. Law. Oh, Harvey Johnson. Mr. John A. Law appeared before the board for the purpose of discussing the building problem confronting the Saxon School District number 70. Um, and that they were trying to um, annex a portion of Southern Shops District into the Saxon Mill District. And so these often deal with borders. They deal with questions of something's not right at a school. And so they um, work with landowners for purchase of property, various things like that. So if you know your ancestor had something to do with property that was being bought or given or used for schools, you may find them in the Board of Education minutes. And different of the minutes, um, some of them are more formulaic, some of them are a little bit more, I'm just writing longhand notes and typing them. Um, but you can see in the, the third item on the right-hand side of the page that it was a regular meeting, not a called meeting, um, and they had various requests and, and petitions about a variety of things. So uh, a really cool resource. If you have a teacher in your family, this is someplace you're going to want to look. It's the Spartanburg County Teachers Directory. This one happens to be for 1936 and 37. We have volumes for most of the 20th century on the shelf in the Kennedy Room. Um, so they have who is serving on state boards. They have information about the State Board of Education and the Education Association, Educators Association, legislative delegation, you know, a lot of different people to, um, who had interest in education. You will also notice in this, there are ads for school equipment and things um, because this was going out to all the teachers in the district. So they knew who counterparts at other schools were, those types of things. It went to the, um, State Board of Education as well. Um, and um, these school equipment advertisers, among others, uh, helped defray the cost of these books to make them more reasonable. But it also got their ad and their information in front of the teachers who might be buying the um, items for their schools. Um, it does include some school statistics. So for 1935 and 36, they had 573 white grammar school teachers and 181 white high school teachers, 171 colored grammar school teachers, and 10 colored high school teachers. So, um, and how many students they taught and, and that kind of thing. So it, it gives you some very interesting um, information. And um, that there are some standard high schools of Spartanburg County um, with their principal and what their location is. So this is an example of a page that has the various schools listed. It lists um, Piedmont School District number 14, the trustees who were in charge of that school district. Um, so you, if your ancestor was a school district member, board member, um, they would be listed. And then Piedmont School Principal, three teachers. Um, Cross Anchor, you see the high school and the elementary school, and then the colored school. So they list everything by district 
white and colored, they are separated, but they are in the same um, district listing. Um, there's also a South Carolina school directory. Um, this one's for 1973 and 74. Uh, we have some years more available online. Um, if you search for South Carolina school directory and the year, um, you should be able to get many of them on the South Carolina Digital Library, among other places. It is statewide. It lists the Board of Education staff, state committees, athletics resources, school administrators, and school board contacts. So it does include um, all types of schools. So you see in the table of contents, uh, area vocational schools, colleges, state and private, county district superintendents and supervisors, uh, information about the educational television network, uh, because you know before the internet, uh, they, at least in Virginia in the 70s and 80s, had a channel that was largely PBS for public school teachers um, to use in their classroom. Um, <laughs> and you met their airing time. It was not on demand. Um, depending on your generation, you may or may not remember that. Um, any federal schools, higher education commission, uh, parent teacher Congress, public schools by counties, private and church schools, regional education board, school board association, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of items that are um, covered in these books. You get phone numbers for state superintendent, administration and planning, and um, various uh, people like that at the State Board of Education. And then this is what the county school listing looks like. It has at the top um, the county office uh, location and phone number. Um, it has all of the um, staff of the county office, and then it has district offices, it has names of schools uh, with um, their principal, their address, their telephone, and their enrollment and teacher numbers. So it gives, again, some basic statistical information, but if that is your uh, person who is a, a, an administrator, is a principal, it can really help you date and, and confirm which school were they teaching in at that point in time. If they were like my mother, they taught in, uh, she was in three different classrooms in the same county over the seven years that she taught in, in my home county in Virginia. So another micro local resource for school information would be photographs and yearbooks. So the image on this uh, page is from our historical digital collections, and it is of the uh, 1966 entering class of Spartanburg General Hospital School of Nursing students. So sometimes you get a class photo, sometimes you get individual photos. Um, oftentimes elementary schools prior to the 60s or 70s when they started doing more uh, elementary school yearbooks, um, those would, you would have a class photo and, and they overlap. Um, my mother has a class photo of a second grade class she taught um, in the late seventies. So it depends on the school. It depends on how big the school is. So um, early 20th century, you may also find text only yearbooks. My grandmother's uh, yearbook in 1939, I think is when she graduated from her high school. I think there were 18 in the class, um, but they had a class picture and then they had a text only yearbook with all the superlatives and who best, most likely to poetry written the whole nine yards. Um, but then, and, and you may have school newspapers which I don't have an example of tonight, but um, hopefully we'll have time for next time. Um, but by the mid to late 20th century, you will find photo yearbooks for elementary, middle slash junior high schools, high schools, colleges and universities and training programs, such as what is pictured. Um, we have uh, 
digital collection, which includes a large number of the little general yearbooks from um, the uh, Spartanburg uh, Regional Hospital um, Nurses Training Program, um, Spartanburg General Hospital. That's why they're the little general uh, for the nurses. And um, you need to just be aware that what grades people are in and what level of school they're in is going to dif differ depending on the era and the location. Um, and it, I mean, even now, Dorman High School has a ninth grade campus and a 10th through 12th grade campus. Other schools have eight through 12 at the same building. So it just depends. Do a little research. So this is an example of one of our elementary school yearbooks, our Chesney Elementary School, 1991, Soaring for Excellence. Um, it, if you are researching teachers, you can find some great pictures in these yearbooks um, and see how their hairstyles change over the years or don't. Um, but you get faculty listings as well as student listings. You get um, general uh, photographs of what's happening around the building. Again, what was their school life like? Whoever you're researching. Um, and at this time, uh, Chesney went from pre-K through um, eight, seventh grade. And then eighth through 12th was at the high school. And there was no middle school or junior high. So it's just something to remember. This is 1978 Evans Junior High. And so again, we have our uh, principals and administrative staff. We've got some general photos there. Um, don't forget to check the sports teams. Um, you may find that sports and activities give you a really good clue as to who your ancestor was. Um, Fashions change, let me tell you. Um, you may find them in, in band uh, or chorus. So these, you know, again, you're not gonna get a great picture of the person, but you get a listing, you can tell what instrument they played, those types of things. And it helps fill out more of what their student experience would have been. Um, and this is uh, some student listings as well as some general pictures. Uh, you can tell uh, the era with the design of the car and the hairstyles. Uh, but it's, it's really fun. Um, this is an example of a high school yearbook, the Spartana in 1962. Um, the name of yearbooks sometimes changes over time. Um, we do have on our shelf the, the yearbooks cuttered by, um, divided by the name of the, or the, the main name of the school, and then the name of the yearbook and the year. Um, the issue with this is the um, Spartana is the first era and then it changes to the saga, which alphabetically comes first. So people look at our shelf and think, oh, you don't have any Spartanburg yearbooks before 1971. No, we have them. Just keep looking on the next shelf. Um, because alphabetically, saga comes before Spartana. And um, so some of them changed multiple times. Um, so just take a look around. If you don't see what you're looking for on the shelf, ask a staff member. Um, we are starting to work to digitize our yearbook collection. And so more and more will be available on our uh, historical digital collections website. Uh, but some of them aren't yet. Our library also has the policy that we are practice, that we um, shelve yearbooks in the branch closest to where the school is or was, if we have space in that branch. Um, now, some of our branches have a little bit of a turf war going on where part of our uh, Broom High School, et cetera, yearbooks are at Packlet and part of them are at Calpins. Uh, so check our catalog and make sure you check the location for a specific year. 
again, we're trying to get them online so that that is less of an issue. Um, but one of the things that you may find in the yearbooks listing of the, the teachers, but little information about, oh, the language department, they have people who are native speakers of this language. So you may find interesting side bits about the teachers as well as the students. And then um, particularly for senior year or final year, you will get um, superlatives, you will get listing of, hey, they were in this activity or here is their um, inspirational quote that they picked or that kind of thing, which can be very, interesting to read and get a snapshot of who that person was at that point in their life. Um, again, check for clubs and activities. Uh, this has a yearbook photograph, a yearbook um, committee, um, poster contest, junior red cross and their little pinafores. And so um, boys, clubs for men, clubs for women. Um, you also have sports for men and women. This just had some, some good images of individuals plus the whole team, some action shots from games. So, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to figure out different snapshots of people's lives at different eras. Um, another place to look are school histories. Um, now we have a department seven, a uh, department, come on, Charity. Um, <laughs> School District 7 um, for Spartanburg, they have a history that was done at, at kind of an anniversary time a number of years ago. Um, we have this Landrum Schools Through the Years book, which covers the 1880s through the 1990s. Um, and so some of these are going to be more comprehensive than others. Some are just an overview about general school information. Some have a lot of photographs. Earlier ones, not so much because the expense of printing photographs has changed over time. It has become less expensive to print, period. And it has become less expensive to print photographs and not just text. So something to remember. Um, so there are some snapshots of, this is the 19 aughts. Um, so in 1908, there were eight students who graduated and it names them. Um, and then a list of fees, the tuition was $20. There was an incidental fee of eight. Board, if they were boarding at whatever the location was. Um, it's a Spartan High. So, um, and then tuition for music if they did music. So you find out some little gems and you get some pictures relating to, it was an academy. Um, and then again, just to show things changing through the years, this is the 1983-84 school year. They uh, wrote about the leadership of uh, Jane Summers, and you get to see bus drivers, um, and then uh, various folks in a couple of the sports teams. So again, you never know what you're going to find in these particular uh, books, but it certainly is worth looking for. Now, one thing that uh, Martha Walker did was she went to those school directories and for each decade, she pulled together the information from those year by year school directories that we looked at earlier for Spartanburg County. And so she just pulled out the Landrum Schools, District 45 information. And so you get an overview of what years, which teachers were in the school, at which school, and you can check and see, oh, did they change schools? Those types of things. But again, these are literally lists from those other directories. Um, although I'm not sure about the coaches. 
but the coaches may be in this, the other directories, but that may be an additional um, listing for that they did for this book. So never hurts to look, never hurts to ask the question. And so that is just a brief uh, run through of our, um, some school resources, some micro local resources that you're going to want to look at locally. Now, as yearbooks get digitized, high school and college yearbooks are coming online on places like Ancestry more and more every week. So you may find those online sooner rather than later. Middle school and elementary school yearbooks are harder to come by. There were fewer of them printed and they're smaller and they were likely to be, especially the uh, elementary school ones, paperback. And so um, that can be an issue. You also do run into a del uh, delay of posting online um, that, a lot of uh, repositories do not post yearbooks that are less than 20 years old simply because of not wanting to post um, pictures of students younger than 18 to 21. Um, just simply because, you know, you never know who's in that child custody battle. And so you don't want to post the brand new yearbook online. Um, my personal opinion on that one. Are there uh, questions? If you find the chat bucket um, in your Zoom controls, feel free to shoot me a question um, or shoot Cheryl a question. Uh, Cheryl Bland is my assistant tonight from my team and I appreciate her help managing things. Once I'm sharing my screen, I cannot see anything else. Um, handouts will be available next month um, and they will cover all three sessions of the micro local resources. Um, I appreciate your uh, patience with that. Um, it's been a very busy January and February so far. So, um, but if you have questions, I'll give you a shot to uh, type those questions into your chat box. Um, but thank you all for coming. I hope to see you again next month, first Monday of the month, seven o'clock Eastern time. And also um, on the 19th uh, at 9.30 and 11, we do have two more lectures in our Lineage Society research Lineage side that let me get this name straight. Lineage Society application and research series uh, on how to find the information to research um, the connections back to, um, in this case, a uh, Revolutionary War ancestor and how to research that patriot. Um, the registration for that is through the library's. Um, uh, events calendar on the 19th. The sessions in the morning at 9.30 and 11 are online, um, virtual only. And then if you are in Spartanburg and you have a burning question about uh, how to research and how to apply for a society or lineage society, uh, there are some um, consultations in the afternoon that you can schedule as well. So thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you're, you're finding it helpful. And um, we will see you next month for the part three conclusion of this mini series. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.